Welcome to the EKG Guy. My name is Dr. Anthony Kashu. I'm so glad you're joining us today. Now, either you're coming back for another case, which is awesome, or it's your first time. Either way, so glad you could join us today. Um, now, we're going to be doing the cases right from our free practice uh, site where you can have registered for free. So uh, many of you are already on it, but if not, this is uh, the site right here, practice.ekgguy.com. So simply go there. You could register for free, get started, and uh, we'll get through this case. Now, I know there's many of you, and it's always amazing to see those that continue to follow us. Follow us on Facebook. There's now over you know, 1.3 million of you. So uh, truly a blessing. Never thought this would happen. Thank you for joining us, and I'll see you in the case. So here we have an ECG obtained from a 77-year-old female with known ischemic heart disease. So let's look at this. So on initial glance, you should notice that this is a regular wide QRS rhythm. The QRS duration was 148 milliseconds, so wide. The ventricular rate, 71 beats per minute. Okay, so within a normal limit. And apart from the QRS intervals, the actual other intervals were quite normal. So meaning the QT interval as well as the PR interval. So you can see those are normal. So the main thing we want to see, so notice again, wide QRS complexes. So the width is beyond that 120 milliseconds. We said it was 148 milliseconds. We said that this is a regular wide QRS complex rhythm. Okay, and if we looked at the rate here, so the rate, knowing that, again, this is a standard 12-lead ECG, all right, so this is 10 seconds. 10 seconds times 6 is 60 seconds, which is one minute. And so if we look at the ventricular rate, because it looks like all of the P waves are conducting at normal uh, conduction lengths, so the PR interval is normal, so the atrial rate should correspond to the ventricular rate. The computer gave us 71 beats per minute. Let's see if we can get something similar. So ventricular rate. Uh, is equal to the number of, say, QRS complexes times 6, and that'll give us in beats per minute. So if we were to look at this one, all right, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Okay, so we have 12 uh, QRS complexes, which is 78 beats per minute, all right? And similarly, if we were to find the atrial rate, we notice that there's a P wave, for every QRS complex. Notice this here is actually a T wave, so that don't get that confused. These are all P waves that are preceding each QRS complexes, okay? So the ventricular rate and uh, is 70 beats per minute, and so should the atrial rate. So we have a normal atrial and ventricular rate. Now when evaluating the rhythm, we see the presence of those upright P waves in lead two. So lead two, we see these upright P waves. We looked at the rhythm strip. All of these P waves have a similar morphology. And if you looked at the P2P interval between all of them, they are all constant, okay? So constant P2P interval, you have a uh, axis that is actually normal. Notice in AVR, you could see these inverted P waves. There's actually one there as well. So inverted P waves, so normal axis, normal rate, regular P2P interval, constant P wave morphology, um, all of these favor normal sinus rhythm, okay? So that is in fact it. So the, the first thing we want to uh, keep in mind here is that sinus rhythm is present, okay? So this is normal sinus rhythm. If someone mentions just sinus rhythm, that infers that the rate is normal. Otherwise, they'd characterize uh, the sinus rhythm as sinus bradycardia if it was a lower atrial rate or faster atrial rate sinus tachycardia. Now, when assessing uh, the delayed intraventricular conduction, the wide QRS complex, we can see that there are QS complexes in the right precordial leads, okay? So if you look at right precordial leads, V1 and V2, you can see these are QS complexes um, that we see. And if we look at the left uh, lateral leads, so V5 and uh, V6, and even lead 1, what we see here are broad monophasic notched R waves in those lateral leads. So Here's V5 and V6. Okay, we see that there's notching in these. These are broad um, notched R waves that we see even uh, here in lead uh, V1 and looks like as well as in AVL, okay? So we see, see those that are present and these latter findings with the associated prolonged QRS interval and the delayed intrinsicoid deflection in leads those lateral leads, 1, V5, and V6, these are all consistent with complete 
that bundle branch block, okay? And the complete, because again, why QRS complex? Uh, the complete or incomplete with any bundle branch block is based on the width, the conduction through the ventricles, the interventricular conduction. So in this case, it is a complete left bundle branch block, and that's common the case in a left bundle branch block. Now, in addition, notice that we have ST segment depression and T wave inversion most noticeable in leads V5 and V6, and we have ST segment elevation and upright T waves in leads V1 and V2. And these are discordant STT changes, meaning they're going in the opposite to the main QRS deflection. These are considered expected normal findings in left bundle branch block. If, however, concordant STT changes were noted, this could suggest underlying pathology such as ischemia. And so this is similar to what we see in, say, a right bundle branch block and left, we almost need to see the opposite. So if you look at these lateral precordial ears, here's V5, notice your main deflection is upright and the STT segment is negative, that's discordance. So if you draw the baseline, notice you have a little bit of ST depression and then here you also have T wave inversion. So that's a normal expected change. Now in V2, uh, you have a similar thing. So notice this is negatively deflected, that QS complex. You have some ST elevation, and then your T wave, which is here, you have an upright T wave, okay? So those are discordant changes to keep in mind, okay? Now, a final point on the ECG here is that the mean QRS axis is actually normal. In some cases, left bundle branch block can result in left axis deviation, uh, while this could help support left bundle branch block, it's not a required feature for the diagnosis. And so um, if we look here, the axis was actually positive 20 degrees. So how do we find the axis? Well, notice here, here's a lead one, here's a VF, okay? Lead one is mostly positive, so heading towards uh, this lead. And if we look at AVF, well, most of the area there seems to also be mostly positive. If we look at lead two, which sits here, at positive 60 degrees, okay, also heading towards it. So in a normal axis range, we said sometimes it can end up in this area here, which is a left axis deviation range, okay, but not a requisite for the diagnosis of left bundle branch block. Now, a few final tips before we leave this case. Now, unlike right bundle branch block, left bundle branch block does not or does affect the diagnosis of left ventricular hypertrophy. So LVH, left ventricular hypertrophy, the diagnosis is affected by a left bundle branch block pattern. And the same holds true with acute myocardial infarction or injury. Now, multiple methods have been proposed to help diagnose acute myocardial injury in the setting of left bundle branch block. And so a main few features you should keep in mind to help diagnose acute myocardial injury in the right clinical context, you should consider a few things, okay? Now, the first one is that you wanna look for at least one millimeter ST segment elevation in leads with a positive QRS, meaning concordance, okay? So again, what you would say is uh, if you have a positive QRS complex, so for instance, this one here or this one here, you would want at least one millimeter of ST elevation. So they'd be, again, going in the same direction, concordance. We don't see that here. So we would want to see at least one millimeter like that. So that could be suggestive of acute myocardial injury. Another thing to look for, and again, you would just need one of these, would be one millimeter of ST segment depression in leads V1 to V3. So V1 to V3, normally what we're seeing is that ST elevation because of that discordance from the intracondu conduction defect from the left bundle branch block. But however, if you saw instead of this, you had concordance where you had ST depression, okay? So it was depressed below that um, the baseline. That could also, again, suggest the concordance, but the presence of um, injury. And so you're looking for that in V1 to V3. Now, the other thing is, what if you have significant ST elevation, meaning you have these uh, in V1 to V3, but instead of, you know, this one only has a few millimeters, maybe two to three at most, what if it's, if it's greater than five or reaches five millimeters, so the ST elevation is this high? Well, that is clearly too high, and that could suggest acute myocardial injury, okay? 
And that's, again, just out of proportion discordant changes. There's a lot of criteria, the Scarbosa, the Smith modified Scarbosa criteria. Uh, there's a few others that recently have come out. So keep those in mind. In general, you want to have a few in your back pocket uh, to look for those findings. Um, the other tip that I, I want to mention is LVH, left ventricular hypertrophy, because it can be interfered by left bundle branch block, should not generally be diagnosed if left bundle branch block is present, okay? So again, if you're thinking LVH criteria is met, but you see a left bundle branch block pattern, don't also diagnose uh, LVH. Okay, so that's an important thing. Now, if you had a prior ECG, maybe you could uh, be able to tell there's a prior LVH the patient had, and then essentially after that defended, uh, developed left bundle branch block for, but if you're only presented a one ECG, don't, and you have to choose one or the other, choose the left bundle branch block that supersedes it uh, in that case, okay? Now, be cautious of left bundle branch block causing a pseudo infarct patterns, okay, that it would uh, where it kind of mimics an anteroseptal MI. So you could see QS complexes uh, in leads V1 to V3 and even up to V4 with ST elevation. So notice as we, we see these here, okay, you see also some ST elevation that could mimic it. It could extend to V4. We don't see that here, but that could mimic uh, that pseudo infarct pattern as we see here of an anteroseptal MI. And less commonly, you could see uh, an inferior MI, at least the, a pseudo infarct from the left bundle branch block causing uh, the appearance of such. And that would be Q waves appearing in the inferior leads. We don't see any uh, Q waves in the inferior leads uh, to suggest that, but that's one thing to keep in mind, okay? So those pseudo infarct patterns. All right, so in conclusion, the following should be the things you keep on this final interpretation here of this case. Sinus rhythm, okay, this was normal sinus rhythm, and this complete uh, left bundle branch block. So two key findings that we have here. Well, that's the end of this lecture. I hope you learned something. I hope you found that case helpful. You learned something and took something away that you can use to benefit the patients you care for, or even teach it to some of your students. Again, thank you so much for joining us. If you haven't registered, register for free at practice.ekgguy.com or follow us on Facebook uh, and stay in touch.